first home and after a year or so we bought this an apartment on the third floor of this huge building. And this area changed beyond recognition. It was all empty. There were no buildings, there were empty spaces, empty plots. Um, orchards, citrus fruit, and a lot of places to play. Um, there were a lot of Iraqis in Ramat Gan. For some reason, many of them ended in this town, and we came to live here. And many of the people, the families in this building, were also Iraqi, and most of my friends were from Iraqi families. And my memoir begins here uh, with the following episode. Uh, my father came to me when I was playing in the street with my friends and he spoke to me in Arabic. And I was acutely embarrassed because everything Arab was considered ugly and primitive. The Arabic language was considered the language of the enemy, something to be ashamed of. Uh, and I remember how utterly embarrassed I felt and I went red in the face uh, and I couldn't s and I replied to my father in monosyllables uh, in Hebrew, the very bare minimum that I could. Uh, and I wanted to say to him that it's okay to speak Arabic at home, but in front of my friends, I would rather you spoke to me in Hebrew. But I didn't say um, uh, anything. And he started learning Hebrew, but he never had a proper command of the language. So life at home was a mixture of languages. My parents spoke only Arabic. They addressed my sisters in me in Arabic and my sisters and I replied in Hebrew to them and spoke Hebrew uh, uh, among us. My, my father was an extremely wealthy merchant in Baghdad with a very high social status. He knew many of the ministers. He had a, a business of importing um, building materials from England. And ministers used to come to his store and um, buy um, and not pay, uh, not actually pay for the materials. And he never chased them down for payment. Uh, and uh, they would make it up for him by giving him government contracts. So the system was corrupt, but not really nasty as it was to become later. We did not choose to leave Baghdad. We were not Zionists. We had no interest in Zionism or in the newly born state of Israel. My mother whom I interviewed at great length for my memoir, used to wax lyrical about the wonderful uh, Muslim friends that we had in Baghdad. And one day I asked her, did we have any Zionist friends? And she looked at me as if this was a very strange question. And she said, no, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. It's nothing to do with us. So. We did not come here because of the lure of Zion. We were forcibly conscripted into the Zionist project. Uh, and Psalm number 38 says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, there we wept, as we remembered Zion. But I had two 
grandmothers. One of them, my, my paternal grandmother, lived with us in the flat upstairs. She never left the house. She didn't speak Hebrew. Um, and she always used to speak about Iraq as Jannah al Allah, as paradise. And so did my maternal grandmother. So for my grandmothers, um, the psalm should be inverted by the rivers of Zion there we sat and there we wept as we remembered Babylon This is Yahalom Primary School. I studied here from the age of 8 till 12. I was not a good student and it wasn't a particularly happy period in my life. Um, looking back, I think that the main factor that held me back was the fact that I was an Iraqi, that I was an Oriental Jew, and um, I did not encounter any direct discrimination, but contempt towards the Jews of the Arab lands was in the air, it was everywhere, and I felt it acutely. Uh, all the time. I um, did not misbehave at any stage and I always received very good for behavior in all my school certificates uh, but I had a very poor grades in um, all the subjects uh, and I failed English outright my mark for English was four. And at the end of every year, there would be a parents' meeting. My father didn't come to parents' meeting because his Hebrew wasn't good enough and he didn't really understand what was going on. My mother was an assiduous at attending meetings. And every year, they tried, they, um, Every year the teachers wanted to make me repeat the year because I'd done so little work. And every year my mother persuaded them that I'm talented, that I have potential to give me another chance and everything would be okay. And uh, I remember in particular one form teacher when I was about 10 or 11. Her name was Sarah Greenberg. She was a Holocaust survivor. She uh, was a very good teacher, very dedicated and highly strung. And she couldn't understand how when we were given such opportunities for an education, she couldn't understand why I didn't take any advantage of this opportunity. Uh, and. Um, I never raised my hand to answer a question. I sat at the back of the room silently and I never opened my mouth. I never participated, I didn't do homework. Uh, I used to daydream, look outside the window and daydream. And my mother remembers that she said, Mrs. Greenberg said to her about me, his indifference makes me explode. And I could never leave this down. My mother would imitate her German accent and her melodramatic manner. But I think it was, um, it was a, a fair comment about me. I was passive, 
and indifferent and lacking in any ambition or any uh, uh, drive. But the worst year in my primary education was in uh, when I was 12 and when I was 14 sorry when I was 14 and I had for another form teacher who, whose name was Miriam Lenz and she didn't like the kids from oriental families and there were many in our class maybe 30 or 40 of us were from Arab countries she didn't like us there was a cultural gap between us she particularly disliked me and one time I was wearing a gold chain with a star of David and a ring which I received for my bar mitzvah and she told me to take it off and humiliated me in front of the whole class and the other episode happened at the end of primary school when there was a national exam called the Seker which was kind of um, IQ test and my marks were extremely low <laughs> but I passed the Seker uh, to her great surprise and disappointment so she discussed the results of the whole class and then she came up to me and glowered at me and she said I hope you understand that you only pass the Seker because of the concessions that are made to oriental boys and I looked at her and I didn't reply but I remember thinking to myself why is she saying this to me why doesn't she just say congratulations well done and uh, in any case how does she know since this was not a school exam but a, um, a national uh, test how does she know that I only passed because of the concessions that I made to Oriental Jews and that I didn't pass with flying colors by any standards so th this was a particularly um, unpleasant experience which marked my um, feeling of being looked down upon, of being regarded as someone from a primitive um, culture and it wasn't a very good um, send-off, it wasn't a very good epilogue to my school career. And it confirmed my suspicion that she was prejudiced against oriental kids in her class uh, and that she was racist to put it bluntly. So this is the Ramadgan town hall and 
My mother used to work here as a telephonist. We moved to a flat in Ramat Gan and, um, in the early 1950s and after, by about 1953, the amount of money that my father managed to get out of Iraq and, and uh, bring here had run out. There was enough money to buy the flat and then to live on for a few years and my father tried two business ventures and he was cheated in both of them um, and um, he um, uh, then he was very he never learned Hebrew properly he didn't know how to function in this society um, Israel was an Ashkenazi trick and he didn't quite know how it works so he never found his place in this society and worse still um, he was unemployed so for about 15 years he was unemployed and when the money ran out my mother got a job as a telephonist and she used to have a small room here she was the receptionist and she used to connect the, there was a telephone exchange and she used to um, uh, do her job as a telephonist but she was a very resilient um, and resourceful and gregarious woman who made friends with people she got to know everybody she came from an Arab culture where uh, contacts were everything Wasta was influence having uh, friends and influence and here she was a kind of a power broker for the Iraqi community any Iraqi woman who had any problem with her utility bills would come to her and she would help them and she also integrated socially with the society uh, here um, the mayor in that time was Avraham Quinizzi and he was very fond of her and she often when she needed any help she would go to him and invariably he would help her. His daughter was the head of the youth department in the town hall and she took my mother under her wing, they were friends and she introduced her to the committee which adopted the paratroopers. Every town in Israel adopts a corps in the Israeli army and Ramat Gan adopted the paratroopers so my mother was very active and as a boy I used to go with her to parties in the mayor's uh, large garden there would be many paratroopers and one stands out in my memory Ariel Sharon who later became a prime minister and at that time he was a lieutenant colonel uh, very loud mouthed arrogant um, uh, character and he's the only war criminal that I've ever met in person. Um, life wasn't easy for any of us. My mother had been a lady of pleasure in Iran. She had never worked in her life. Uh, we had a, a, a palace and uh, about 14 um, servants, we had nannies, and here there were no servants, we lived in a small flat and she had to look after the three of us, my two sisters uh, and I, and she became the breadwinner when my father was unemployed. So there were naturally tensions between them, he was a lot older than her, he did not make the adjustment, he was a broken man and she's the one who held the family uh, together and as a boy I was acutely aware of my father's anguish he never talked, he was silent he never said don't look at me now I used to be 
uh, a rich man and a great man um, and uh, don't look at me now don't look at how the mighty had fallen he was silent he, he never talked but as a boy I was acutely aware of what it was like for him and I, I used to feel very um, great empathy towards him but I never communicated it with him partly because there was a language problem uh, I didn't like to speak Arabic and he could barely speak Hebrew so there was real empathy and affection between us but a linguistic problem that kept us apart My father did have a sense of humor and once he said the Jews have prayed for a state of their own for 2,000 years but they prayed in vain. Did it have to happen in my lifetime? We are here in the central square in Ramat Gan, Kikar Odea. The year is 1961 and it's an election year. I was 15 years old at the time and the speaker was Menachem Begin, the leader of the opposition the leader of Herut that later became the Likud and it is the same Menachem Begin who came to power in 1977 and in 30 years of Labour Party hegemony. And the square was full of people, thronging with people, uh, acolytes, supporters, and Begin stood on a balcony uh, with a battery of loudspeakers, of microphones, and his voice reverberated throughout the square, and he was a spellbinding orator. He never achieved anything. He wasn't a practical man, uh, but he was brilliant with words. And most of the people here were Orientals, mainly Moroccans. They were swarthy, uh, many of them wore gold chains and uh, jewelry. Um, and I stood on my own, I didn't know anyone, but I shouted with the rest of them, Begin la Shilton, Begin la Shilton, Begin la Shilton, Begin to power. We wanted him to win the election and to become Prime Minister. And today I ask myself, what brought me as a young person to support um, a right-wing nationalist xenophobic leader? And the answer is not that he had anything uh, on social and e or economic policy that appealed to me, nor would I have been attracted to his nationalistic and anti-Arab rhetoric. The only explanation of what drew he, me to him was his um, um, attack on the Labour Party establishment and its arrogant attitude towards the Oriental. We are in Ramadgan in Herut Street number 37. 
The year is 1950, and soon after we arrived in Israel, we stayed with my mother's uncle Jacob, who had a villa in Ramat Gan. That is my mother, my two sisters, my maternal grandmother Musli and I. And Musli had been to visit Palestine a few years earlier during the British mandate and she bought this plot of land. So she owned this plot of land and we started building a one room house here in this corner. A municipal inspector came and knocked it down because we did not have a building permit. So my mother found a friend who took her to the mayor of the city who found a compromise that we will rebuild the flat, the house, but it'd be a temporary residence until we bought somewhere more permanent to live. So this is where I spent my first couple of years in Israel. Um, the, the garden was full of trees, uh, fruit orchards. There was a fig tree, there, was, there were two guava trees, there were white uh, and pink guavas. This is the original tree that remains. In Hebrew it is called Ashkedinius or Shkedinius. There is an English name but I cannot recall it at the moment. There are also um, orange trees uh, and lemon trees. Everything was green and lush and in contrast to the stark surroundings. And I used to, even after we moved to our flat, um, later on, I used to come and visit my grandmother. My school wasn't very far from here. And she could only communicate with me by piling food on me. She would tell me to sit down. She couldn't speak much Hebrew and I was inhibited about speaking Arabic. And I recall her telling me, Kul, kul, ashumakatakal, eat, eat, why aren't you eating? But I used to love wandering around this uh, area, climbing the trees, picking fruit, picking figs and guavas of the trees. And my mother says that I always had a book with me. So whenever I visited my grandmother, um, I would sit in a chair in the open air and I would read. So apparently I was a bookworm already when I was 5, 10, 15 years old. And the only memorable event of that period was the arrival of a bicycle. My uncle Isaac from Newcastle sent me as a present a rally bicycle which was in a wooden case and I remember the excitement of breaking the wooden case, getting out the bicycle, assembling it. It was shining, there was nothing like it uh, in Israel at the time and I was extremely attached to my bicycle um, and um, I went to school here, very near here, which in those days uh, was not, was in, um, it wasn't built up as it is at the moment and I had a very happy uh, first year at school with a teacher called Hannah who had just graduated from teacher's training school. She was very kind and sympathetic so I had a, a good experience at the beginning of my primary school education, unlike my experience in my last year of primary school with Mrs. Lenz, about whom I spoke earlier.